So we've just heard about some of the amazing loans that are going to be coming to our Artemisia exhibition here at the National Gallery, which opens on the 4th of April. So Letizia Treves, the curator of the exhibition, is here to tell us a little bit more about some of the works that are going to be in the show. So first of all, tell us why is this show so amazing, Letizia? Well, so the idea of the exhibition actually came about um, on the back of our acquiring the self-portrait of St Catherine of Alexandria in 2018. Um, so we've had about 16 months to put the show together, but um, there's never been an exhibition on Artemisia in the UK, which is surprising. Mm -hmm. She even came here in the late 1630s mm -hmm. and joined her father in London at the court of Charles I. Um, but there have been a number of exhibitions around the world on Artemisia, mm -hmm. but this is the very first time um, that we're gathering some of her most famous works and also some um, newly discovered mm -hmm. works like our own picture here at the National Gallery. So who exactly was Artemisia Gentileschi? Well, she was the most famous uh, female painter of the 17th century, of the Baroque. Um, her father was a painter as well, so she, she grew up in Rome, he trained her. Um, and then she went on to have an independent career in Florence and went to Naples as well and lived there for almost 25 years of her life. Her life spanned about, I mean, she had a sort of 45-year career um, and, you know, worked in a number of Italian cities. So I think one of the key loans of the show is probably one of her earliest paintings that she actually completed when she was a teenager, which is pretty amazing. That's right. So the show will open with mm. her first known signed and dated work, which is a painting of Susanna and the Elders. Um, and it's dated 1610, so she's just 17 years wow. old when she paints it. And it is absolutely astonishing. Yeah. I mean, it's such a kind of mature painting, both technically, but also from a kind of narrative interpretation point of view. It's a very sensitive portrayal. And I think you already see what a great storyteller she is. I mean, it is such a sophisticated picture that many mm. believe it's actually by her father, even though the picture's signed and dated. <laughs> because at this time, she is painting in her father's studio. So she's trained alongside her three mm. brothers um, but we know from a letter of 1612 just two years after this picture was painted that um, her father Orazio writes to someone in Florence saying um, my daughter's you know a fantastic painter she's been painting independently for three years and she has no equal um, and you know this picture is really testament to that and I think what she brings to these subjects and we'll talk about it more in a mm. moment is um, she brings a very kind of individual and very particular feminine, if you like, mm. sensibility to these subjects, because she's not the only one painting Susanna and the Elders, mm. a very popular mm. uh, Old Testament subjects, but she really puts herself in the shoes of her protagonist. So she imagines what it's like uh, for Susanna to be leered on by these um, elders while she's bathing in her garden. Um, and you can see by the twist of her body mm. just how sort of traumatized mm. she is. And she really feels physic a kind of physical threat. Um, and I think she really sort of gets under her, her skin, you know, really gets under the skin of her protagonist. It's what makes her such a powerful storyteller. So this is one of the earliest paintings that we're going to have in the exhibition. And I think one of the particular highlights is going to be the two versions of Judith and Holofernes, which was possibly inspired, as some people might have suggested, by something very traumatic that happened in her life. That's right. So when Artemisia um, was in her father's house, she's raped in 1611 mm -hmm. by... Um, uh, Agostino Tassi, who's an artist who's collaborating with her mm. father at that time on a large sort of fresco decoration. And he comes into Orazio's house where Artemisia lives and works and rapes her there. And this is all ex recorded because all the documents relating to the trial that follows um, still exist. So it is really extraordinary that we have these documents that describe um, not just what happens, but also in Artemisia's own mm. words, because you have the testimony of those at mm. the trial, including Artemisia and Tassi. Um, so her Susanna and the Elders is dated from 1610 before this event mm. takes place. But you could imagine that this young girl has already experienced some sort of harassment and she's already in quite a vulnerable position. There are lots of people coming and going in Horatio's house. She's not allowed out, but there are plenty mm. of people coming in and out. So a lot has been read into these leering old men in relation to the imminent um, assault that she experiences. Um, and the Judith beheading Holofernes that exists in sort of two variants, mm. they're not exactly the same. Um, one is in Naples and that one's slightly earlier and that's thought to date from the very end of her time in, in Rome and just before she moves to Florence um, and then the one in the Uffizi probably from shortly after mm. that almost certainly painted as a sort of showpiece to gain yeah. patronage um, in Florence um, but it is so brutal 
I mean, it is absolutely astonishing that someone in paint can uh, portray this horrible moment of a woman beheading Holofernes. Now, it's been shown plenty of times before, and Caravaggio, of course, paints it in a very violent way. But his Judith is totally impassive. She's this very grand sort of heroine. Um, but Artemisia really portrays the kind of nitty gritty of this really grisly task. And it's for her, that's what I find so fascinating about her. She really imagines what is it like for a woman to have to overpower this huge bulk of a man, this general. And so she gets her maid, maid servant to help her. So the maid servant in the story, in the Apocrypha, standing outside, mm. keeping watch. But in Artemisia's painting, she's basically straddling Holofernes, pinning him down. <laughs> and Judith is really sort of hacking his head off. And there's arcs of blood spurting. I mean, it's, it, it is a really, you, you mm. know, it's, it, it's a really tough picture to look at. But I find it so interesting because it really embodies, I think, mm. what Artemisia brings to painting, this very different sort of sensibility to her stories. So after the trial she's married, she moves to Florence and it's really there she starts to use her own image almost to promote herself. That's right. I mean, I think there's there's a certain sense of kind of practical mm. um, issues. So it's much easier mm. to just look at it in a mirror and use your own face than it is to hire models, which mm. was costly. It was expensive. Um, there's a letter later in her life where she complains about how expensive it is to hire good models. So she uses herself. She was also famed for her beauty. Mm. Um, so this is one of those pictures where Artemisia assumes a sort of role mm. or assumes a guy. It's rather like in the self-portrait of St. Catherine of Alexandria. So here it's um, a very literal self-portrait. We know mm. there are portraits of Artemisia, so we really know what she looked like, mm. and this is very, very faithful to those. So she probably copied her own mm. face from a mirror, but then she's shown here playing the lute. Now, we don't know if she played mm. the lute. She was certainly musical, um, but there is this very intriguing reference to a Signora Artemisia in 1615, taking part in a performance mm. at the Medici court, um, where she was apparently dressed as a gypsy and mm -hmm. singing and dancing. And it's, it's, I think, extremely plausible that mm. this is a sort of reference to that, mm. possibly painted for the Medici, um, because the picture's described in a 17th century mm. Medici inventory. Um, and so it's, it's a play acting, but mm. it might also recall a real life event. Um, and here she is dressed in this sort of amazing costume with a sash tied around her waist, with this wonderful sort of cloth wound around her head. Mm. And she's actually got this beautiful little gold hoop mm airing um yeah so 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 it it, it definitely looks like artemisia mm. but it's her also taking on a role yeah um but i think there's also a sense of sort of all this self-promotion so a way mm. of marketing yourself mm. and your paintings by using your own image and she sort of play acts and um there's a, a lot of play acting in these mm. self-portraits where she assumes the guise of st yeah. catherine or a lute player in the picture in hartford um which we're borrowing which is very closely related to our picture um and I think this is in part, as I say, to kind of promote her own image, rather like Rembrandt mm. does as well mm. in the Netherlands. It's a very conscious act of um, promoting herself. And I think one of the really exciting things for me about the exhibition is we're not just going to get to see her paintings, we're going to get to learn about Artemisia the woman through her own words. That's right. I, I was very keen. I mean, obviously, Artemisia is such a famous figure in mm. art. Um, and some people may know her work. Some people may know her life story, but not necessarily mm. be that familiar with her work. And she has become a sort of feminist icon. Mm. But um, I was very keen to kind of get under the kind of hu out the human side mm. and really have a kind of uh, Artemisia more fully in the round in this mm. exhibition. And she is a very kind of empowering uh, figure. I mean, she's, she's incredibly resilient, tenacious. I mean, you hear it from her letters. But in 2011, this extraordinary group of letters were found. They're very intimate letters written by Artemisia to her lover, Francesco Maria Maringhi, who was a, a wealthy administrator mm. she met in Florence. Um, and of course, these letters are, were never really meant to be read mm. by anyone except him. But what they reveal is this very sort of human side of Artemisia, um, a very vulnerable side at times. And I think for people to see her handwriting and to see um, her names written so mm. sort of legibly, you know, it, it, it sort of gives me goosebumps. Mm. You know, it makes her feel very, very real. Mm. She's not this the sort of no. iconic figure. She was a real woman of flesh mm. and blood who felt, I mean, one of the letters we're borrowing is, um, she writes just after her four-year-old son dies and it's scrawled, you can see her sort of emotional mm. turmoil in the way it's very messily written and um, you know she talks about just being kind of ripped apart by mm. grief um, at the death of her son mm. and you know this sort of human element and this human side of Artemisia um, also the kind of jealousy yeah. towards her distant lover because she's by this point in in Rome and her lover is still in Florence um, I think will br really bring Artemisia to life for people.
and she spent 25 years of her life in Naples running her own workshop. What was so special about that city and what did that offer to her and her career? So after sort of reaching new heights of fame in Rome in the 1620s, she moves briefly to Venice, but then effectively settles in Naples in mm. 1630. And she stays there till the end of her life, um, but she doesn't like it. I mean, within mm. five or six years, she's writing, complaining about the way, you know, the, the kind of the, the cost of living, the kind of, you know, the violence. She, she's very keen to leave Naples and she's sending pictures all over <laughs> Europe to try and gain employment elsewhere. But she does end up staying there a very long time, except for this brief mm. trip to London. But what Naples gave her was a whole series of opportunities she hadn't had before then. Um, firstly, she paints on a very different scale. She's suddenly painting much larger pictures and I think that's going to be very obvious in the exhibition um, just the sheer scale of the pictures the monumental canvases um, her very first altarpiece is from 1630 it's in a, a painting she paints as soon as she's arrived in Naples and you have to remember until that point and she's already in her 30s by this point um, she's not painted anything that's on public display anywhere in Florence or Rome. So this is the first time she's painting with that in mind. She's also working alongside other artists. So mm. she was very much welcomed into the artistic community in Naples, which was not an easy thing. Um, you know, other artists like Guido Reni, Domenichino had been driven out of Naples, had been effectively bullied out of Naples. But she's clearly welcomed there and she becomes part of um, the kind of artistic scene. So in some paintings, um, she contributes one or two canvases to a series mm. of pictures, uh, 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 a sort of cycle of paintings. Paintings. In other cases, like in this painting of Bathsheba, so this picture shows um, David and Bathsheba. David's actually tiny, he's this very tiny figure here <laughs> on, the, um, on, on the balcony in the palace behind. So rather like Susanna, Bathsheba is shown bathing mm. and David spies her um, from afar um, and ends up seducing her and she bears him a son. Um, and here, uh, this picture is, is by Artemisa, but also in collaboration with two other artists, with Viviano Codazzi for the architecture yeah. um, beyond, and with Mico Spadaro probably for the mm. landscape. Um, and this is something that was entirely mm. usual, that artists would collaborate with other artists. Mm. Everyone had their own sort of specialisms, um, so you might you know, work with an architectural painter and a landscape painter. Uh, and it shows just also how integrated Artemisia mm. was in Naples um, and, and worked with other artists on single commissions like this. I mean, I love this wonderful detail of the, of the basin here in the foreground. Your eye is really drawn mm. to that. Um, and of course, Bathsheba, like Susanna, uh, and these subjects were mm. often paired in 17th century collections. They were sort of really seen as kind of erotic subjects, mm. or they could be painted in an erotic way mm. um, because they showed semi-naked women bathing. But here Artemisia does paints uh, Bathsheba in a much more sensitive way. You can see actually her nudity is concealed. So you can see the white drape covers her mm. and her arms actually concealing her breasts. So we're not actually mm. shown any nudity at all. And the focus is really on this very elegant interaction between Bathsheba and her maidservants. So again, she brings a sort of different um, sensibility to this subject. And the white, you, your eye is really drawn to the center of the painting, isn't it? Like Susanna, mm. I mean, I think you have this sort of glowing mm. naked figure who's really the kind of center mm. of the story at the very center of the picture. Picture. Um, so you're immediately drawn to, you know, you end up sort of admiring her rather like mm. David admiring her on the palace mm. balcony beyond. So it's, it's quite apt that one of the most exciting rooms in the exhibition is going to be called the female hero because that's basically what Artemisia pretty much was. That's right. And I think, you know, a, a lot of pictures of female protagonists are mm. associated with Artemisia because um, that's what her reputation has been built on in the modern day. But mm. I think also in her own time, she was known for these pictures of biblical heroines, mm. Susanna, Judith, um, Cleopatra, mm. you know, Lucretia, these female heroes that she turns back to these subjects throughout mm. her career sort of turning afresh to these stories every time and sort of reinterpreting them. And I felt it was very important to sort of dedicate a room to that. And why? What made her so different mm. from contemporaries? Why would I as a patron go to Artemisia rather than to one of her male mm. peers? And I think the point is that the patrons would determine what subject they wanted. So they would say, I want a painting this big of Judith um, and Holofernes. But it was up to Artemisia really to have some sort of artistic mm. license and how she would portray that. And I think male patrons knew, the predominantly male patrons, knew they would get something different from Artemisia. And they knew that there, would, there was certainly an additional appeal of having a picture of a female by a woman. Mm. I, think, I think there was definitely this sort of USP that mm. she had, and she was perfectly well aware of it. Mm. 
Um, and of course she came here to London as well. She did. So she comes to London in the late 1630s. We don't actually know exactly when she arrives or when she leaves, um, but she probably comes in the course of 1638. Her father um, is in London at that point. He's been in London since 1626 as court painter to Charles I. And I was very keen in the exhibition to sort of have um, a room really reuniting father and mm. daughter because the exhibition begins with Artemisa in mm. her father's workshop and sort of seeing in a way how far she'd come. Um, and so they're reunited in London and one of the big projects she's thought to have had a hand in is the ceiling, which was originally in mm. the Queen's House at Greenwich, which Orazio painted for mm. Queen Henrietta Maria. And it's now at Marlborough House um, in St. James's and it was moved there in the 18th century. And it's thought that she may have had a hand in that. I mean, the degree of her participation is much debated. Mm. Um, but we know she painted pictures here. She even mm. sent a picture before arriving because mm. one of her pictures is being framed in London well before she actually arrives. Um, but of course, the most famous picture mm. from her London sort of period is uh, the self-portrait as allegory of painting. Mm. Um, and this is a picture, it's, it's really the only firmly identifiable picture that Artemisia painted in London. And it is the self-portrait as an allegory of painting. And there's been a lot of discussion about whether this is a very literal self-portrait. Mm -hmm. You have to remember Artemisia was in her 40s mm -hmm. when she paints this. And you know, I think this woman looks a bit younger than that. And also the physical impossibility of being able to paint yourself mm -hmm. at this angle. Mm -hmm. You know, you would need a sort of very complex system yeah. of mirrors. Um, so I think it's a more sort of figurative self-portrait. Mm. I think it's a real embodiment, if you like, of painting and of what Artemisia believes painting should be. And that is a very physical, not a contemplative act, a very physical act, very purposeful act. And I think, you know, showing painting as a woman, mm. uh, personified as a woman here at an easel, um, you know, holding her painter's palette with her brush poised, she's about to embark on her painting. The, you know, you can see the canvas is completely clear in front of her. Um, so for me, this captures sort of everything and it calls to mind some of these great sort of phrases she puts in some of her letters towards mm. the end of her life to her famous patron, the Sicilian nobleman, Antonio Rufo. She famously writes, you know, I have the spirit of Caesar in the soul of a woman. You know, it gives you this sense of real grit, a kind of very tenacious figure. Um, and also she famously said, mm. you know, let me show you what a woman can do. <laughs> and that always comes to mind when I look at this picture, um, because I think it really does embody everything um, Artemis your thought about painting. So why should people come, I mean it sounds absolutely amazing, why should people book and come to see this exhibition? Well I think there's the fact that we've never had a chance to showcase Artemisia in this country and I think it, it, it's about time to do it and also with having acquired our own painting we were the right place to do it. Um, it has been a real challenge getting the loans. Mm. Um, you know, she's hugely sought after and there have been a lot of other exhibitions in recent years and I think it will be a real challenge for people to do it again for another mm. sort of generation. So I really think it is uh, an opportunity to see um, some of these really mm. famous pictures um, alongside also some less well-known pictures, the more recently discovered pictures. So, um, you know, I, I hope also bringing through the human element of the letters, um, people get a kind of more profound mm. and more rounded understanding of Artemisia. Whether you come to it to just look at the paintings or because you're fascinated by Artemisia as a figure, I think there's sort of something for everyone. <laughs> Sounds absolutely brilliant. We can't wait to see the exhibition and tickets are on sale now at the National Gallery website.